Hey everyone, Firegross here, and today I'm bringing you my comprehensive twink leveling guide for all classes. This guide re-optimizes the old Hollow Palm Smite build with new gem and POB setups and also includes some new tech that allows us to keep permanent uptime on all our flasks, giving us approximately 300k DPS by Blood Aqueducts on a build that hits the res cap and leaves us with a healthy amount of life as well as defenses such as Wind Dancer, Acrobatics, and Physical Damage Reduction via Taste of Hate. Unlike my previous Twink leveling guide, this guide has fully fledged POBs for all 7 classes that were individually tested in each case. Each POB has multiple sections to show how your tree should evolve as you level, and each POB also has its own set of notes custom tailored to the leveling path of that class. This new guide also provides you with continued support beyond the campaign to show you how to level this character to at least level 80 before needing to respect your desired build. As always, this information can be found in the description below the video, and with that said, let's get right into it. So to start off with all the information that I'm about to explain has already been laid out in this spreadsheet in the description of the video. You have trade links to all the items that you want. You got uh, information about the gems and how to upgrade them, flasks, the, all the POBs, and then you have a cheat sheet which gives you generic information so that in case you don't wanna watch this whole video and in case you don't really you know wanna spend too much time researching all the POBs and understanding what's going on, you can pretty much just upload the POB for your class and go, go read this and then this is gonna give you step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, as quickly as possible, but I'm going to explain it in more detail here. So to start out, you want to have a character set up with an inventory and equipment that looks pretty much like the following. You want a silver branch, a gold room, a tabula rasa, seven league step, a darkness enthroned with two dexterity jewels in them, and then preferably iron rings, although they aren't necessary. You want a life flask and two mana flasks, rather than two life flasks and one mana flask. You want to acquire two Quicksilver Flasks, ideally you roll Perpetual or Chemist prefixes on them, and you roll one to have used when charges reach full using Instilling Orbs, the other one doesn't really matter as you're going to be using this as a backup. And then you're going to buy the following gems, Puncture, Pierce, Chance to support, uh, Poison Support, Caustic Arrow, Pierce, Chance to Poison Support, Mirage Archer, Volley, Onslaught, as well as Smite, Ruthless Support, Ancestral Call, Maim, Added Fire, Melee Fizz, Faster Attacks, Elemental Focus, Elemental Damage with Attacks. Then you want to buy the gems Elemental Weakness, Hatred, Herald of Ash, Herald of Purity, Dash, and Flame Dash. As for the remaining items that you want, you want a one with nothing small cost jewel, and this is pretty much at the core of the build. You also want the Taste of Hate, Chemist, and, uh, sorry, Sulfur and Silver Flasks. Ideally rolled in similar ways to one of your Quicksilvers where you have Chemist or um, Perpetual Prefixes as well as used when charges reach full via instilling orbs on them. And as for the remaining items that you want, you want a Praxis, two Lay Hooper Balls, you want a Karui Ward with Freedom of Movement optionally anointed onto it, you want Replica Karui Ward with optionally Freedom of Movement anointed onto it, then you want an Astramentus with Tribal Fury anointed onto it. If this is too expensive as it requires a Gold Oil, you can also just put Freedom of Movement onto it and then you want the Nomad Belt. So upon reaching Lionize Fall, you're going to equip the following gems. You're going to put Puncture, Pierce, and Chance to Poison into your Silver Branch, and you're going to socket Caustic Arrow, Pierce, Chance to Poison, and Onslaught into your Tabula Rasa. You're then going to do the next few quests, you'll level up to level 4, at which point you can equip your two Quicksilver Flasks, you can equip Dash, and you can also equip Mirage Archer and Volley Support into Tabula Rasa as well. In the next level, you reach level 5, and then you can equip your Karui Ward. Now for all classes except the Scion, who has to wait midway through Act 2 in order to do this transition, you're going to hit level 12, and at that point you can equip your one with nothing cluster jewel. You need to check your class's POB to see exactly which jewel socket you're supposed to be at, and how to pull this off. But basically, once you hit this, you can then do your transition, and that involves putting the one with nothing uh, so uh, jewel into the socket, you te allocate Hollow Palm Technique, you unequip your bow, and then you're going to replace all your gems here. So you're going to put Smite in, you're going to put Ruthless Support in, Ancestral Call, Maim, Added Fire Damage Support, and you're going to keep Onslaught Support in. Now it's very important that you have no weapons and no gloves equipped in order for this to work. And then the final change you're going to make at this point is also to replace your Karui Ward with a Replica Karui Ward, as this is going to then buff your area damage, in, you know, which Smite does. Now you have a few more upgrades that you can make once you get to Act 2. To start with, at level 16, you're going to socket Herald of Purity and Herald of Ash into your gear, and you're going to be able to equip both of those and use them at pretty much uh, straight away. They're going to just be a straight up buff to all the damage you deal, and there's not much else to say about that. 
Once you reach level 18, you should replace main support with faster attacks. When you reach level 20, you can replace your replica Karui Ward with an Astramentus. Now, if your tribal, if your Astramentus has Tribal Fury anointed, you can also replace your Ancestral Core support with Melee Fizz. Now, this is really important because the Astral Core support provides a huge penalty to your damage. It reduces your damage by about 20%, and you get you get half of Ancestral Core's effect in terms of striking additional targets via your anointment tribal fury although the thing is quite often there aren't enough enemies around for ancestral call to proc both times so you're not really losing that much from swapping to the anoint but this anoint basically allows you to have extra aoe where smite is dealing its area damage to two groups of enemies at one time and you then get an extra support gem in once you're able to acquire mana leech on the tree and this differs greatly depending on which class you're playing as you're going to be situated you know quite far away from it in some cases you're able to replace one of your mana flasks with a taste of hate and once you acquire the cold conversion nodes on the tree round about here you're going to also be able to replace your added fire damage support with elemental focus support it's important to wait until this point because you do not have fully converted uh, elemental damage uh, until you run the cold conversion nodes at which point you know running elemental focus is kind of a waste something to keep in mind however is that we don't crit when we're using Hollow Palm, and therefore we can't really apply ailments anyway, so the penalty of not being able to inflict ailments doesn't really exist for us. Now, early in Act 3, we're going to reach level 22, at which point we can equip one of our Praxis Rings. It is possible to just run two Praxis Rings if you really feel like it, but it's not very necessary. I'm just going to leave that one up to you guys. Um, you can easily get away with just using one and using your Mana Flask to get by. When you reach level 24, you're going to equip Elemental Weakness, and you're going to use this to curse bosses. It reduces boss elemental resistance by quite a lot, and it increases your damage very noticeably. As well as that, you're going to equip Hatred at level 24, and you're going to remove your Herald of Purity. At this point, you're only going to be reserving mana with Herald of Ash and Hatred, instead of Herald of Purity. Once you reach level 24, you have access to both Lay Hoop of All Rings. These are huge increases to your damage and survivability. However, it does come at the cost of giving up a Praxis Ring. So what I've found, personally, is that it's more comfortable, often, to just use a single Praxis with a single Lay Hoop of All, and then later on throughout the campaign, when I feel like my Mana Leech and my Unreserved Mana is in a better spot, I then upgrade to a second Lay Hoop of All, but you have to pretty much play this by ear and do this depending on your own personal preferences. There isn't any right answer. I know some people prefer to use a Lay Hoop of All just like twice right off the bat, and other people like to leave it till later in the campaign. Early on in Act 4, you're going to reach the level requirement in order to uh, equip your Sulfur Flask. You want to remove your Mana Flask at this point, although the thing is, if you don't feel like your Mana Leech is comfortable enough, you can keep your Mana Flask a little longer, but I find at this point it usually feels pretty comfortable. I don't really have too many issues. You obviously don't want to sit there spamming you know, your attacks on bosses, but you also don't need to either, since you do a lot of damage. So this is just an easy swap over, and of course you want to roll all your Flasks the same way. Chemist or Perpetual Prefix, and then used when Charges Reach full. Now, uh, later on in Act 4, or potentially early on in Act 5, it sort of depends, you're going to reach the level requirement for your Chemist's Silver Flask, or your Perpetual Silver Flask. Again, same deal, use Instilling Orbs on these so that they're used when Charges reach full, and you're going to replace one of your Quicksilver Flasks. Now, the Quicksilver Flask that you remove is going to be the one that doesn't get used automatically, right? In this case, this one, where it says reused at the end of Flask Effect. This is your backup Quicksilver Flask, and this is the one you want to get rid of. For, for obvious reasons. Now, once you've equipped your Silver Flask, you then want to remove the Onslaught Support Gem from your Six Link and replace it with Elemental Damage with Attacks, as obviously you don't really need to get Onslaught uh, you know, from your gem anymore. It's pretty much a wasted gem, and that's about that. Finally, early in Act 6, you're going to be able to, to equip the Nomad Belt. Now, the Nomad Belt is a really great belt. Uh, it's extremely underrated, and it's very overpowered for this particular Twink leveling build, and it gives us a lot of stats that we care about. So first off, when we have at least 200 strength, we get, you know, up to, I believe, 25% to all resistances. This is pretty damn nuts. Um, this helps us easily hit our res cap, even after the, you know, Katava reduces our resistances. Um, if you really need the extra strength, you can equip, uh, you can allocate, sorry, some strength nodes on the tree. Although this belt also gives you quite a lot of strength, so, you know, it's very easy to pick up the amount that you need without very much effort. On top of that, you're also going to be running attributes via your Lay Hooper Balls and your Astramentus. So this typically isn't a problem. I'll just show you on this character, like, we easily have enough of, you know, all the attributes that we need, so... That 
usually I haven't found that to be a problem, but I'm, you know, I'm just mentioning it, mentioning it in case it is. It gives you global fizz damage, which is increasing your base damage that everything else scales off. It's giving you a very nice dexterity roll, and both the strength and the dexterity can be increased via the attribute um, modifier catalysts, which are intrinsic catalysts, I believe. And then finally, 50% increase of last charge is gained. Now this is multiplicative with the uh, the perpetual mod on flasks so if you look at this the perpetual prefix says increased charge recovery that basically multiplies on top of the increased flask charges gained and it will allow your flask to pretty much stay online for the most part all the time you do need to also take some additional flask nodes on the tree such as natural remedies and careful conservationists but you know as you can see these flasks are being used automatically when they reach full and most of them have a decent uptime without me even killing anything now if i go start killing things i'm going to be getting tons of flask charges back and you'll notice that pretty much all your flasks are just permanently online at this point uh once you equip the nomad i, I rarely ever saw my flasks not active and i guess a lot of the time when they weren't active was when you know i was moving through rooms and there weren't a lot of mobs around and i you know was transitioning to bosses that sort of thing So I just wanted to go through an example of a POV just to sort of show you exactly how it works and what you need to look for. Um, and we're going to use the Templar because I think Templar has the most interesting sort of POV setup. And, you know, obviously this all this goes without saying you will need a lot of regret orbs to make this work. But it's kind of okay because cutting your leveling time down by a couple of hours means that that's a few extra hours of farming, you know, at some point where you can recoup the cost of the regret orbs. So to start out, this is what the Act 1 path looks like for the Templar. By, you know, the time you reach Mervel, you're going to have access to Hollow Palm Technique. And you're just going to come along here. You're going to pick up the Dex node, you know, just to make sure you reach your attribute requirements. Although this shouldn't really be a problem anyway, since you have the Karui and the Replica Karui ward the whole time. Uh, I mean, this Dex node is totally optional, in fact. But, you know, it's, it's still alright to have, uh, pick up, and we don't have that much else to grab. Now, Act 2 is going to look something like this. So, for those who aren't aware, we use the Dex Conversion Jewels on the Templar, the Marauder, and the Witch, depending on, you know, the setup. And so, for the Templar, you're going to put Fluid Motion here, and you're going to put Fluid Motion here. Now, what this does is it takes this Strength Node, this Strength Node, this Strength Node, this Strength Node, you know, all the Strength Nodes within the Radius, and it just converts them all to Dexterity. And then the same thing here, you know, in this case there's one, two, three, four, five within the, the radius, and it just, all these travel nodes get converted to dexterity, which is important because Hollow Palm Technique scales our damage off of our dexterity. And so we're just going to do that, we're going to pave all the way down here, and then this is where we're going to end up at around the end of Act 2. Now, when we get to Act 3, however, you'll notice that something, you know, changes. Once we've made it down here... We're now in a better, you know, position for a better cluster spot, and we don't need to spend these extra travel nodes. So we actually unspec a hollow palm from this socket, and we remove all the nodes that we used here. C since we need to use this junction anyway to get to the rest of the tree, we just respec the hollow palm uh, sockets down in here, and we're also picking up the life and mana leech nodes that we can start using our Le hoop of alls without having to worry about um, life and mana flasks along the way and of course all this is just travel nodes we're picking up as many dex nodes as possible along the way though this is so, you know this sort of stuff is decent quality of life as we go and we're going to pick up the strength node just for the sake of having our strength requirements just in case you know like we're lacking act five comes in and we're getting natural remedies utmost swiftness and winter spirit so these are kind of the three most important things to pick up you know as soon as possible and it almost it kind of sucks a little that the templar has to wait so long before getting these so without winter spirit you can't really run elemental focus and a lot of your extra elemental damage stuff is gimped a little bit by not having access to the conversion sooner but it's not too bad utmost swiftness of course of course is giving us percent decks and is like uh, 70 decks alone as well as the 8%. It's really big for adding base damage, so of course we want this node. And then Natural Remedies is giving us a whopping 45% increased flask effect duration, as well as 10% increased effect of flask. Now, moving on to by the end of the campaign, once we hit Act 10, we're gonna be picking up Wind Dancer, we're gonna be picking up Primeval Force. We also get Aspect of the Lynx, Weapon Artistry, Aspect of the Panther, Finesse, Acrobatics, we're going to get this next Flask node. Now, this is another one of the new ones that was added, where we're getting increased Flask charges gained and then reduced Flask charges used. This is all Flask quality of life, and this contributes to 
how we could keep our flasks up permanently using the instilling orbs, the rolls on the flasks, and the nomad belt. We come up here, we're picking up Gemini, and we're picking up Blood Drinker. Definitely sucks to pick up Life Leech this late on the Templar, but we, you know, it, it is what it is. And of course, by the time that you pick up the Life Leech up here and here, you can then drop this node down here since it's a, a little bit irrelevant at this point. Um, the Templar does suffer, I think, the most in terms of not having access to a lot of life nodes since we spent so many points traveling to this part of the tree. But it kind of works out okay because a lot of the other ways to level up a Templar really suck and are much slower. So even if it, you incur a few deaths along the way, I don't really think it's too much of a problem. I did practice this uh, particular path and I think it got a little sketchy around Act 4 for me, but then it picked up, you know, towards the end of the campaign especially. And then we have the mapping tree. And so what the mapping tree is, it's just about beefing the character up a little bit and making it a little more appropriate in the case that we want to, you know, level the character up to 80 before transition to something else, such as a forbidden right totem build. You know, maybe you don't, maybe you're not ready to bring the build online or you bought a bunch of gear that has higher level requirements. And so this is what this is for. And as you can see, we're picking up the life nodes here. We're picking up some extra life nodes here. Ambidexterity down here some extra life nodes here here we're picking up forces of nature um and this isn't really that important i guess at this point but we're gonna get it anyway and then revenge of the hunted and all the life nodes over here and this sort of beefs up the character to close to 3k life of course if you are leveling up to 80 with this character you do want to replace your body armor and your boots at the very least with life and res boots and body armor and then Potentially, you want to replace the gold room with, you know, a higher life option, but that's totally up to you. It sort of depends where you're at and what your stats are looking like. And so, as you can see, taking a character to this point, even without fully upgraded gems, just having this tree set up, gives us about half a million damage. So you could easily level this character up in Delve to level 80, and this is uh, unascended as well. So if you were going to ascend, you know, for example, let's say we were going to play Forbidden Right Totems, You'd be picking up Conviction of Power probably along the way, and then you'd be adding some extra beef to the class, I guess, in terms of the Endurance Charges. A lot of other Ascendancies have more offensive options. Um, in case you're wondering why I didn't just gain a big jump up in damage, it's because Hollow Palm technique does not really allow you to crit. There are ways to crit with it. Uh, you do need to run a certain amulet, and you can do that if you're interested in doing that, but it's not really that important. Uh, once you scale crit, you have to go all in on crit in order to be able to crit you know at any rate that is respectable and adds a significant amount to your damage so it's easy to just not worry about it since we're not going to go you know all in on a whole bomb build this is just how you would take the tree if you were trying to level the character up as far as possible getting to level 80 pretty, pretty much allows you know make sure that you can equip all of the you know atlas bases and you know items like uh vermilion rings which i believe require level 80 in order to be equipped and that sort of thing um and th at that point you can just transition to whatever build you want obviously you're going to need a lot of regret orbs but you know i already explained that earlier and yeah so that's what that looks like and don't forget that the notes section up here the they explain step-by-step -step instructions for this class okay so these aren't just generic notes that i've uh i, I i've copied and pasted like you know paragraphs or sentences but the notes are basically hand tailored towards the class and give specific instructions regarding how to optimize that class and how it moves through the passive tree since they're all very different i'll just, I'll just give you a quick example of something more conventional a ranger you know the ranger starts over here and then you can see the tree evolve as such so we go down here then act five Act 10, it's already built out all this stuff and it really doesn't have to worry about this. And then for mapping, we loop back around here to pick up some extra life nodes since the character ends up being a little squishy otherwise. But yeah, so that's what that looks like. All, all of the class POBs are completely different and are, you know have been custom made for each of the classes. They've been tested extensively by either myself or a friend who helped me out. You know, he had a bunch of classes and builds he wanted to try out. So I handed him, um, the tweak leveling guide before i released it and basically said you know try out this guide and uh, let me know how you go and if you have any problems and so he ended up testing the marauder the scion and the witch and he said you know they were very clean runs he did them all in about three and a half hours and he's not a particularly fast leveler so i think that just sort of goes to show build works does fine he took them all to level 
between level 82 and 85 and then did his respecs and he didn't have any problems at all although he did level and delve not maps so uh you know take that uh, however you will but yeah that's uh those are the POVs. So I'm going to end this video off with some gameplay footage as well. I recorded a bunch of full acts because I wanted to sort of show how clean that this build could be, but I decided I'd sort of uh, have a bit of fun with it and show you the most scuffed act that I ended up recording. One of the ones that I, <laughs> I had to go to the recycling bin to pull it back out since I had deleted it out of shame. But um, it's a 10 minute act 10 run in which I died, I think like four times. Uh, they were all stupid, avoidable deaths that, you know, uh, there's no, no excuse for, but I did want to sort of show you so that you can see that you know obviously as much as i do want to pump this build up and you know say that it's a great well-rounded build with uh, great defenses and you know it moves fast and it does a lot of damage it's not a mortal and if you play like an idiot the way i did you will die and you will have a bad time so obviously you don't want to do that i do want to apologize for what ended up being more than a week-long absence from youtube i got very caught up in this and my time management is terrible this was originally supposed to be a two-day project and it ended up just taking more than a week because i decided i wanted to pretty much test every single character and every single pob separately i didn't want to do a one-size-fits-all sort of thing because if this is what we're stuck with going forward if ggg don't revert any of the changes we're stuck with increased monster life nerfed damage nerfed flasks etc it's i think important for everyone that we have a good twink leveling resource where we can still level the maps within about three hours if you found this guide helpful please give me a like comment or a subscribe if you need any further help feel free to just hit me up on stream i'd be happy to answer any questions you have or provide any further guidance uh, regarding anything that you, you don't feel was adequately covered in this video but for now i will see you in the next one